please be seated. <laughs> We're out of practice with this, just saying. <laughs> no children's time today, sorry. Again, technical. So the message is from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do not know him and have seen him. Oh, excuse me, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, You've been with me all this time, Philip, and you still don't understand? To see me is to see the Father. So how can you ask, where is the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you aren't mere words. I don't just make them up on my own. The Father who resides in me crafts each word into a divine act. Believe me, I am in my Father, and my Father is in me. If you can't believe that, believe what you see, these works. The person who trusts me will not only do what I'm doing, but even greater things, because I, on my way to the Father, am giving you the same work to do that I've been doing. I will do whatever you ask in my name. That's how the Father will be seen for who he is in the Son. I mean it. Whatever you request in this way, I'll do. This is the word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thanks, Tammy. So there's a lot in this scripture this morning. We're going to concentrate on the fact that all of these words were delivered Monday, Thursday, the last night Jesus had with his disciples. And what we know today, and what was true then, is that one of the things that people do at dinner tables is tell stories. They tell stories not just to pass the time while they eat, but because stories are an important part of the fellowship, the love, the joy, the connection, and sometimes a little more, <laughs> that we find when we share a meal together. In the context of Sunday dinner, whether with a family and friends or with Holy Communion, storytelling is also a part of how we connect with Jesus with God and with one another in those moments. Communion stories or litanies in our modern, modern vernacular remind us of who we are, why we are together and what the table is preparing us for. For us as Christians, these stories find their origin and anchor in Jesus' words and teaching like those we just heard from today's gospel reading. As we, as I said, join Jesus and his disciples at the Passover table on Monday, Thursday. We hear Jesus tell his disciples of the great commandment to love one another for the first time, which he models by washing their feet. We hear him prepare them for what is coming, saying, though I go away, it is to prepare a place for you in the presence of my Father. I will come back for you and we will be united again in time. He also assures them, I am the way and the truth and the life and anchors this in all of what he shares that evening in a blessed and broken loaf of bread and a shared cup, ordinary elements offered as tangible symbols of God's love and as a means to remember God's love in him. Exodus 24, 11 captures the whole of this moment. They beheld God in Jesus and ate and drank. But where does all this come from beyond where Jesus is speaking? Listen for the parallels, if you will, between Jewish history and how it shows up in Sunday dinner as we know it, as Holy Communion. 
In the Jewish Passover feast tradition, which is where Jesus was with his disciples, after the table is prepared and all is ready for the meal, the elders present are asked, why is this meal more significant than all the other nights, all our other shared family meals? It's a prompt for their answer to retell the ancient story of Israel's deliverance from Egypt. The meal is eaten in celebration and commemoration of that exodus from Egypt, but the story is not just shared as a recollection of an event in history. It is also told as a present enactment of salvation. In the Passover meal and its table talk and stories, past becomes present. The present generation remembers not only who they are, who they were, but who they are, as they remember and enact what it means to be one of God's chosen people now. Following the tradition of our ancestors, we might ask ourselves why today's meal is special above the other meals. Because for us, too, the answer lies in the stories of our past, biblical stories that reflect our shared history, like beginning with I mean, the apple and ending with the Lord's Supper. Food and eating and drinking are significant in the faith of Israel. They're also significant for us today. Though we are looking at just Passover today. In a sense, for the Jewish people, every meal is a sacred occasion. By beginning each meal with a prayer and a blessing of the food before them, the food is claimed as a gift from God. And the meal itself is as a sacred occasion to come close to God. Remember in the temple, in the stories through Lent, where they would come and they would purchase or bring with them a sacrifice that would be burned on the altar as pleasing to God, not as a sacrifice, sacrifice or as atonement, but as an invitation for that pleasing odor to rise to God and the invitation to come back from God to share a sacred meal. It's like that. And for us today, that sacredness and connection with Jesus was established in his words, as often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me not just here, but as often as we do it. Back to the meals. Viewed as sacred, our ancestors of the faith saw meals and food as accessible ways of being with God, a means of celebrating the mystery of God's presence in the ordinary things of everyday life. Ordinary bread, ordinary wine, ordinary people, ordinary conversation. Where the sum of the meal's human and divine connection becomes something more in its sacredness, something tangible, something real. Meals are often offered as a sign of hospitality and friendship. They can be as simple as a child sharing a candy bar with a kid down the block or opening doors as your child brings home someone they love to meet the family over dinner, or the practice of a speaker at a recent clergy gathering I was at who shared that her family's practice of hospitality is to invite someone new or unexpected to their table every week as a way of building relationship through shared meal and story. In the Old Testament, Abraham receives three strangers into his home, prepares a feast for them, and is blessed for his hospitality. In Psalm 23, the psalmist sings, Thou preparest a table before me, in the presence of mine enemies and anoints me with oil, an act of hospitality. So let's look at this in a different context. In the Near East, to be admitted to someone's table is a sign of lifelong devotion and undying loyalty. So there's a story about a nomad who's being pursued across the desert by his enemies, desperate he comes upon an encampment and rushes up to the tents in hopes that the strangers there will receive him. He runs to the head tent, throws back the curtains, and sees that the inhabitants there have just begun to eat. Now, out of breath, he looks longingly into their faces, wondering if they will take him in or turn him away. They motion for him to enter and be seated, and he sighs in relief. Then his pursuers reach the camp, go to the head tent, and they too throw back the curtains, ready to seize the man and kill him. But when they see him at the table, they withdraw 
and leave him in peace. For they know that in the Near East it is an act of great hostility towards the host to trouble a person seated at their table. And so the psalmist says of God, This the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Food for thought. And just as an invitation to someone's table is a sign of human hospitality, so it is a sign of God's hospitality. The prophet Isaiah picks up this theme of invitation in speaking of the Messiah to come when he says, All who are thirsty, come to the water. Even those not among God's chosen will be brought to God. Whoever has no money, come buy food and eat without money at no cost. Buy wine and milk. Behold, you shall call nations that you know not, and the nations that knew you not shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. For Israel, looking to the arrival of the Messiah meant to look forward to the day when God's anointed one would come and invite all the poor and hungry to a great feast, which would, according to Isaiah, eventually include even those nations that you know not. Sharing a table is also a place to ratify a treaty or a covenant. At the Last Supper, Jesus says, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you, echoing the Feast of the Covenant on Mount Sinai. When Moses goes up the mountain with 70 elders of Israel and the Lord yokes himself in love to Israel, their meal there is a seal for this covenant of love between they and God. Israel was effectively God's guest at that meal, seated as a nation at God's table. Mind you, Israel would go on to break that Sinai covenant many times. But Jeremiah told of a day when God would make a new covenant with them. I will put my law within them, and I shall write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. This covenant Jeremiah spoke of was unlike any of those that had come before. This time, God would bind God's self to God's people, not on the basis of what they could do for God, but solely on the basis of God's love for them. Which brings us to today's gospel reading. Once again, I bet you thought I was never going to get there, did you? As the disciples looked back on that meal in the upper room, they would come to believe that as the cup was given and blessed by Jesus, they beheld God and ate and drank. The presence, the joy, the love of Jesus continued through the disciples as they embraced everything that Jesus had taught them, doing great things and sharing meals together, perhaps along the lines of this imagined Sunday dinner. It is Sunday evening, the day when the business life of Jerusalem resumes after the Sabbath holiday. As the sun sinks from the sky, the streets Streets slowly empty as shopkeepers tuck away their wares. Workmen mingle on a corner for a moment, and a farmer coaxes his donkey out of a stall so that he can head towards home. Down a narrow passageway at the ground floor of a nearby warehouse, you glimpse people entering a small door toward the rear. They're a mixed bunch, old and young, an occasional Roman slave, a Jewish couple of some means, an old shepherd from outside the city walls, a civil servant, two young women with their faces covered, and more. As darkness descends, their lamps flicker and slowly disappear behind this door. It's clear that they are being closely examined as they enter. Whatever questions they're being asked must have nothing to do with race or finances or class because it is clear that none of those factors are common among all these people who are being admitted behind that door. So we follow and enter ourselves, walking into a large room where 30 or 40 are gathered around a simple wooden table. A man is reading the writings of one of the Hebrew prophets from a scroll illuminated by two small lamps. 
All present listen intently until he finishes, and he rolls up the scroll and steps to the rear of the group. An old man, clearly respected among those present, then steps forward into the light and begins to speak, urging those assembled before him to fulfill their lives in what they've just heard, read from the sacred scroll. When he is finished, psalms are chanted and prayers are offered one by one, simple prayers for others, for a woman executed for failing to bow to the emperor, for others in jail awaiting trial, for the sick, the persecuted, the poor, and more joyous things too, like the birth of a child. The prayers end with a loud amen by all. They then embrace one another with the kiss of peace to seal the prayer and prepare for the evening meal. Helpers among them move along gathering the wine and little loaves of bread that each person who was able has brought with them. They place the collected goods, all the food on a table and a prayer of thanksgiving is offered by the overseer of the gathering, arms outstretched over the offering. He gives thanks for the work of God and creation of the world, for the, God's love for Israel and for Jesus Christ. Hear any similarities? He recalls Jesus' meal with the disciples in the upper room, how he broke the bread, gave it, and the cup to his disciples with the words, do this in remembrance of me. This prayer also then ends with a loud amen by all. Each person present is then given a large piece of the blessed bread and each takes a sip of wine. After all have eaten, the leftovers are gathered for later distribution to orphans and widows. With the recent persecutions, there are many to be fed. Any sick or in need will also be fed. And once the leftovers are prepared for delivery, the overseer once again raises his hands over the people and blesses them. They go forth, fed, nourished, blessed in this time with their Lord, out the door into the darkness, each lighting a lamp to show the way back into the world. This is Sunday dinner, the Lord's Supper, where Christ is present and alive and at work in the world, in the midst of them, in the midst of us, in us. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life represented in this and in so many other ways in our faith, what might want us to look at it in this way. Jesus, I do not come to God through my prayers, not my belief or being good enough or being Christian. I come through you, Jesus, the love of God made flesh. You bring me as you bring all people, no matter their religion. It is your love and not anything I do that is the way I become close to God. I do not need to ask you into my heart. You are already here, loving me infinitely. I only need to allow you. I surrender my doubt that you love me and my pride that you should love me. I surrender my resistance and I allow you to love me. Christ, I do not come to God beside you, but through you. You take me into yourself and I come willingly. You take me in and I become part of you. As I take in your bread and it becomes part of me. I am part of the life of love, the love that is the way, the truth, and the life. Take me in, beloved, that you may live and love through me and I may live and love through you. Amen and amen. Amen.